this conversation with Natalie Mole, Director General of FPIA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, and Jan Lecam, Chief Executive Officer of Euraudis, Rare Diseases Europe where we'll be discussing the joint statement on patient access to medicines for rare diseases, which the two organisations have just published. And it contains a series of proposals for solutions to improve the lives of people living with rare diseases through better access to transformative medicines that already exist and sustained innovation for tomorrow. The report acknowledges that the recommendations it contains cannot, and I quote, entirely alleviate the access challenge that rare disease patients face. But they believe that these proposals, and again I'm quoting, collectively represent an important step forward and a foundation for future collaboration. So today we're going to discuss what drove the two organisations to work together on this report, the key recommendations that have emerged from the process, and how they hope to take this work forward with other stakeholders. So great to have you with us. Natalie, first and very obvious question, why did you decide to work together on this? Well, we have a long-standing uh, collaboration, communication, dialogue with your audience, obviously, because they represent the patients that we try to treat. And uh, in the last three years, we've been analysing in a lot of detail what the access hurdles and access realities were for medicines in Europe. And we found some very disturbing data as that, you know, I think we were all considering, but if you see that products can be accessible to patients after 100 days in Germany and 1,000 days in Estonia, mm -hmm. you realize there's something very wrong that you need to work together to address those access barriers. And who better to work with than the representative of the patients who, who know where the problems lie as well. Mm. And from your perspective, from a patient perspective, Jan, why did you decide to get involved in this process? And why now particularly? Now, because the HTA regulation has just been adopted, which promotes all advanced therapies toward European joint assessment, but after that, all the orphan drugs. So it's time to look at the next step downstream to access. Also, it's the moment where the European Commission is developing their strategy on uh, pharma regarding unmet medical needs and access, and also revising the orphan drug legislations and pediatric legislation. So we thought that's the moment to send clear messages about what needs to be fixed mm -hmm. and to put on the table some concrete proposals in terms of access, because not everything will be solved by the revisions of the regulations. Mm -hmm. But also with the industries, the first time in 25 years of your order's history that we have a joint statement with industry because we thought it was time to show where there is convergences and again to bring it to the European Commission, to member states, to stakeholders and say there are proposals on the table. Can we discuss them? Can we progress concretely? Absolutely. And, and just staying with you for a moment, Jan, in terms of, of the approach, the report says, the statement says, that this is a, and I quote, complex and multifaceted issue. Why is it so complicated to address? Because Europe is complicated, because we have 27 member states, because we have regions, because we have many decision makers on the process, in the process. It's not only about the regulators and HTA and then pricing reimbursement. It's also about who makes the decision at the national or regional levels. And it is different systems across Europe. And that doesn't fit the specific challenges of rarity. So experience shows in the last 20 years that the delays of access are not improving for often drugs. They are always behind the other medicines. That also the, the inequalities across Europe are still very high and are not really reducing. And with the new innovation that is coming in, where there is more transformative, potentially curative therapies, this is just not acceptable. So we have to have a preparedness of Europe to be able to take more quickly the, this new innovation and take it to the patient. Mm. And it also means, doesn't it, that you need, and, and again, your statement underlines this, that concerted action by a lot of stakeholders because it's so complicated. Would you add anything, Natalie, in terms of why it is so complex to address this? Well, we, we found about 10 root causes, so that already tells you it's complicated. Um, clearly, we haven't managed to solve them on our own, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here uh, at the moment. 
Um, there are many different actors involved. There are many different steps, as Jan mentioned, between the approval of a medicine at European level and actually getting it to the patient in the country, HTA, but also many other steps. And it really um, requires commitment with concrete proposals. So what we have today is commitment from two stakeholders with concrete proposals. But as Jan said, this will not be resolved just like that. We need to sit down on some of them. We need to sit down and agree on other commitments from other parties to make sure we can realize that. And there are lots of other elements as well. And rather than try and change legislation to address things such as access, we thought, OK, let's be much more concrete, faster, more predictable than revision of legislation, which can take a long time and be unpredictable because patients need access now. Mm. But, but while that debate is going on about the legislation, you need to do these things in parallel. So in terms of those 10 root causes that you mentioned, would you particularly highlight where you think this statement does address them? And we're talking about a plurality of solutions. Uh, there's a lot. It's a very dense statement. There's a lot of concrete content. What would you highlight in particular, Natalie? Um, so for us, the first, the first commitment that, that we made jointly was for companies to file for pricing and reimbursement within the first two years of approval. So at the very latest, within two years of uh, approval of the product, make sure that we filed in all 27 member states. That is something that is very important to us to make sure that we engage with all those 27 countries and make sure that everybody takes on their responsibilities to try to get the products to the patients. And, and I think that's, that's very new. And, and important, and also to be able to um, bring the problems to light, uh, we've, uh, propo we're proposing to have a portal that will show where the products are in the process in, within those two years, so that we can't just say, there seems to be a delay in Estonia, why is that? But you'll actually be able to go in and see the delay is caused by this. Okay, well then let's address that together. So among that plurality of solutions uh, that the report talks about, Jan, uh, for you, where does it most address the sort of challenges we're facing that cause these delays, that cause this inequity of access? What would you highlight in particular? I think we have two really in this paper. One is what Natalie just mentioned was this portal in order to follow up the applications in the member states, but also the proposals of the industry together to say we're ready for differential pricing in the area of rare disease therapies. So that's very concrete. And now we need the response from the Commission and the member states on, on that regarding European reference pricing, but also on the commitment to assess and to have the negotiation and pricing reimbursement within a reasonable delay, either of the transparency directive, the 180 days, or right after applications from the industry. But the second big, I think, uh, element of this statement is to recognize that in the field of rare diseases, there is a continuum of evidence generation. That the major issue we have in order to discuss value, in order to have a well-informed discussion on the price and on the reimbursement, is the evidential uncertainties at the time of marketing authorization. And this is just a fact which is confronted by the payers or by the assessors, but also by industry, by doctors, by patients. So we need, how do we address that? And the only way to do it is to address it together by recognizing that there is an adaptive pathways over time to generate these additional evidences post-marketing. And we detailed in the, in the statement different possible approaches in order to do that together. And that's a very important message that we're sending together here to say, collection of evidence post-marketing needs to be coordinated at the European level, can be collected at the European level, because there is now the readiness of the healthcare system with the European Reference Network, with the, with the new uh, framework on data at the, at the European level, with different initiatives of collaboration between industry and the healthcare system funded by European Commission so or not. So we begin to have the infrastructure to collect that real world data, to get the evidence we need, and as you say, those adaptive pathways are going to be absolutely crucial as we move forward. So for you, that would be a central issue to address. That is particularly timely because at the moment where the regulation on HCA has been adopted, now we have a window of two years to develop the guidelines before we really get started. We need to get started with the right mindset and the right methodologies to recognize that we have limited evidence at time of market authorization. There is one way to address that, is to plan ahead better with more coordination between yeah. HTA payers and regulators. But there is also another way, is to have the same research questions around Europe 
and have the same methods to collect them after. And Natalie, well, just to follow up on that, this is of course a key issue because when you develop these innovative medicines, these groundbreaking medicines, in some cases there isn't a lot of evidence at the start. This process that Jan is talking about of continual collecting of data assessment for the industry also very important. I, I absolutely and I think even in our proposal when we're revising the orphan drug regulation but we're also revising the whole pharma regulation and one of our proposals is around you know innovative clinical trial design it's, a, it's around real world evidence there are things that are easy to put in place even without changing legislation with guidelines uh, and this is the moment to do it it's the moment to see that sort of uh, everything coming together at the same time, the evidence, the, the revisions, and the commitments, and, and get it right. Okay, we've focused so far on what you agree on, uh, but I wanted to ask you, you're independent organisations, you have diverse memberships, you have differing agendas. Uh, were there some challenges? Uh, what was the... How easy was it to come to this alignment uh, on the issues where you've made recommendations, and were there areas where you simply couldn't make a recommendation uh, because you couldn't agree. I presume there were some. Natalie? <laughs> but what's really interesting for me, Jackie, is that the, the area of rare diseases for me, I always say it, it's the, it's the extreme of everything. It's the extreme of complexity, scientific complexity. It's the extreme of suffering in many cases. It's the extreme of rarity. There are few patients on... And, and when I get my members together, it's also the extreme of differentiation. They're all doing pretty much something else. So when we sat together as a group, you know, Jan and I, that's easy. <laughs> when then we have our representatives and his sitting together, the, the views to bring them all to the same level of understanding and where we could agree, there was a lot of, we started rather wide and, and came in. So I don't know if there were many areas we didn't agree. We had to find the ones that we could work on together. And then there are others that we will work on separately, but the ones we work on separately will not go against the commitments that we have together. Mm. And I think that was really important. Mm. Yeah, and for you, how easy or difficult was the process? Uh, and were there areas where it was tougher than others? In the process itself, what was difficult was to make sure that we understand each other, what the words means and what the concepts are behind, and to go beyond what is being said on the intentions, the real intention, the consequences. Now, what was difficult is within your orders, it was not that easy, huh? yeah, to have the patient's organization to say we should have a joint statement. And there was some resistance around it to say, hey guys, we've been independent for 25 years with parallel messages, coordinated, but we are not on the same boat. Yes, but my answer is that we are on the same river. So if we, we are on the same journey on that river, on different boats. So we don't have the same interest, but we certainly have common goals. So my, the, 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 where we disagreed, though, is on what, what's, what's next after that. And clearly the view of the patients is to go toward European negotiations, joint negotiation, and potentially European procurement, not on all rare disease therapies. We have never said that, and we don't believe that will be the solution. But we think that it's a must for the rarest diseases, for the most complex treatment like gene and cell therapies, and the one having a high budget impact or a high price. And we, it's difficult for industry as a collective to progress in that direction. Some companies are ready for that, Member states, some of them are ready for that, but we need to have that conversation. The curative and transformative therapies of today and even more of tomorrow will be for very rare diseases. We need to have a system ready. If not, it's going to be a market failure, an industry failure, and patients still dying while the innovation exists. Mm. And where do you see the greatest potential for more collaboration with other stakeholders. Uh, you want to get other people on board now, you want to get that conversation going. Where do you see the greatest potential to build on what you've done? What's the, the next phase of your work? And then I we'll would, talk about what you expect from others. I would like to see courage on the European Commission side. Mm -hmm. I would like to see the commissioner, I would like to see the top executives of the European Commission to say, we like these proposals, we are going to discuss it. We're not saying that we should take it, but that we should discuss them. Should we have an EU fund to support generation of evidence post-marketing? Should we have collaboration downstream on access and on negotiation? Should we have a, a greater involvement of industry within the EC-funded projects like the RD Partnership or the, or the Future uh, Innovative Health Initiatives project? or in the partnership between industry and European firms networks. And here, there is a lot of 
not resistance, but hesitations. So it's time to be courageous. For the member states, I would say, hey guys, be consistent. Mm. Be consistent. You cannot complain all the time and stay the little empowered countries to discuss anything. So you need to get your act together. Here you have tier pricing, you have portal to follow up, you have an, an appro a common approach on, on, on evidence. Join your forces together. So we are giving you the tools to make this work, but you need to actually apply them uh, and, and join this conversation and show And there is courage. opportunities. The EU presidencies at the moment, both of France and Czech Republic, are completely in favour of that. And before that, Belgium, Malta and other countries around Europe. But it's just that they need to get together and both the political level and the high executive level. And Natalie, uh, we talked at the beginning about why now this is the moment uh, because of those reviews of the legislation, so on, because health is in the spotlight. What do you hope will happen now in terms of building on this collaboration and taking these proposals forward? Well, you know, as, as we said at the beginning, there are lots of actors here. Our proposals are based on concepts such as solidarity between member states. If the member states don't commit to solidarity, you cannot make equity-based tier pricing work. So we, we need some very strong commitments, just like ours have been for us. They, they didn't take a month or two to build. They took a long time. We need some very strong and concrete commitments from the other side that, as, as Jan mentioned, um, external reference pricing will be done properly, that um, there'll be solidarity between member states so that the, that the member states who are less able uh, to, to contribute economically will be able to be supported by the others in terms of uh, ensuring equal access across Europe. And we need to make those steps forward. Indeed, we don't agree on joint procurement. This is an area where we don't agree on. Um, but we do agree that in cases of cross-border health threats, you know, if countries come together and it improves access, then that's okay. So there are areas where we can really make progress. There is no time. There is no time to wait for the revision. You know, it, it's time to act today and get it right in the revision. And perhaps if we act today and we test these things out, then we'll be able to see which ones would work in the revisions and which ones won't, rather than waiting three, four, five years to see what the outcome of the revision are. Patients don't have time, especially rare disease patients. And that presumably would just finally be your message to politicians, to policymakers who may be saying, look, we're doing, we're, we're focusing, we're talking about the legislation, we're updating it, we're reviewing it, uh, let us do that and then we can come back and talk about these issues later. Presumably, Jan, both of you, a final message to them about why you need to do these things at the same time. Jan first. Because it's not only about legislations, it's also the non-legislative, the policy, and it's also the practice, and it's also the pilot. So we need that, and we need to be very careful because we're losing ground in the global competition. And my concern as chief executive of your audience, as representing the patients, is to make Europe attractive for investment, for the innovation of tomorrow. And innovation is meaningful only if it reaches the patients, and today we are not ready for that. So that's why we need to act now and not to wait for more years. Presumably, Natalie, you were singing from the same hymn sheet on that one. Well, I, you know, Jackie, this is a moment where everybody wants pharma healthcare innovation, especially after COVID. Everybody realizes the value of innovation. These patients have always known that. Everybody's woken up to it after COVID. Um, there is no time. There is just no time. It's, it's, we have some proposals. They're concrete. They don't need changes in legislation. They need commitments. They need dialogue. They need people to come to the table. And in the meantime, let's revise and then put the things that work in that revision. Jan, Natalie, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you Jackie. Jackie.